Our laws as it pertains to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. And welcome, everybody. I see you out there on the Restream as well as on Clubhouse. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, as I uh, had mentioned the last couple of days, we are not going to be here the remainder of the week, and we'll be back on Tuesday and Wednesday of next week, and then subsequently the Friday of only of the following week. So we've got a bunch of travel coming up here. We're going to see the uh, Booth Boys down in Austin, and we're going to be in New York, and then I have to go give a talk in Bermuda and uh, Susan's been waiting for that thing. That's been postponed two years in a row. And so finally, we're going to get there. Uh, very excited to welcome my guest today. It is Dr. Leslie Carr. She's a clinical psychologist with expertise on how trauma, stress, culture, digital technology impact our brain and mind. Uh, she's on the board of a nonprofit called One Green Thing, which is working to address eco-anxiety. We'll talk about that. She has a documentary in the work called The Deadline, which is directing addressing political polarization and how we come together or not to solve climate crisis in particular. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the times we are in and the times we have been in. Welcome, Dr. Leslie Carr. There you are. Thank you so Welcome. much. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. Uh, did I get, I did not get your Twitter handle uh, or any of that. Do you want to put that out there? Sure. I am at Dr. Leslie Carr on Twitter and Instagram. Those are my only two social media channels. And talk to me about what your area of specialty is. Just talk about that area well, that you are involved with. Yeah, you know, I, I it's funny. I have a, a couple different areas of expertise that have kind of collided in a way that is really interesting for the times that we're currently living through, which is basically just, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, the impact of trauma and stress on the mind. Also, um, the impact of digital technology and, uh, tech addiction, and then how to use technology mindfully. Those are things that I have been working on and studying for a long time. And then along comes a global pandemic that increases everybody's stress level tenfold, traumatizes a bunch of people, and sends them basically to their computers and their phones, and people are using uh, digital technology more than they really ever have before. And now we're seeing the long-term impact of that. And... Um, so that's basically it. I think I'm I'm kind of an expert in the things about life that are challenging for people and the things that are particularly challenging right now, I suppose. I, I don't know why it occurs to me to go this direction straight off the top, but, but I'm going to go. And that is that I, I anticipated massive scapegoating I, I could, because of all the childhood trauma and all the narcissism. And the narcissist, because they have envy and empathic failure and have sort of narcissistic rage underground, they tend to manage that by gathering together and focusing on a scapegoat. I, I wanted to write a chapter in my narcissism book about pre-revolutionary France and sort of be, be um, prognosticating about the potential for us to do the same. And lo and behold, well, they told me that it was too speculative. And lo and behold, here we are with the Twitter and cancel culture which is the modern guillotine. People that watch this stream have heard me mention that many, many times. My wife is tired of me saying it, but I, I've said it. But the thing that, um, I, I guess the two questions I would have is, so it came, so there, there's the mirror effect, yeah. So it came, the question is, how do people get out of these <laughs> scapegoating spasms and to what extent, and this again may be a very unfair question because it's sort of vague, but what is his, I, I didn't ex anticipate the hysteria. I didn't anticipate really what was delu delusional thought process. I, I sort of became aware of it when I was hearing people say things that I thought, you said that three years ago, I would have put you in the hospital. And it, it's, so there's a lot of delusionality, you know, at least on the surface in people's thinking. So how do, how do we get through these spasms of, acting out uh, and scapegoating and then to what extent is where'd the hysteria come from and to what extent is that playing a role here 
Oh man, you've just given me a lot to respond to, but um, I know. This Sorry. Is how I no no, it's so fine. This is how I am kind of tempted to unpack it. Just to a couple okay. different thoughts here. One is that the 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 common thread that I hear through so many of the things that you just said is that we are living at a time when a lot of nuance is lost, to put it lightly. Um, people, uh, um, and I'm sorry, I'm distracted by seeing myself, so I'm, I, I, I'm not used to this, but I'm gonna try to stay focused here. Um, can I actually, could I trouble you to put Drew back on the screen just so that I feel like I have someone to talk to? I'm so sorry. So you're talking to me. To That's quite all right. Yeah, I just, hey, I, Caleb, yeah. let's ask her. Is there a way that she can just put me up there? Is there some button she can push? And uh, Yeah, I'm, I'm going to fix it here. I'm going to fix it. Okay. Even All right, she'll yeah, fix it. Right. Be, in the meantime, be, in the meantime both great. of us thank are off. So, thank you so, so much. It's really distracting to see only my face. But so to get back and, and, onto so the thread on. I was saying. Mm -hmm. I would say that la from again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set you up again on this thread. Lack of nuance, black, white thinking, all good, all bad, narcissism, but go on. Well, yeah, and sort of borderline dynamics, right? If we're going to get really clinical about it for a moment. And I'm seeing a lot of broad scale borderline dynamics. And I just actually want to begin by addressing this cancel culture piece. Because I think that one of the things that really disturbs me about the concept of cancel culture is I think that a lot of people uh, really don't even understand what we mean when we say that, right? You know, I am particularly attuned perhaps to the the liberal left, and I'm disturbed sometimes by the things that I hear when people are saying, oh, you know, there's no such thing as cancel culture. It's just about consequences. And I think to myself, I don't actually think that that's true at all. I mean, there have been a number of people, and these are common everyday citizens, that have lost their livelihoods, that have experienced terrible personal consequences, doxing and that kind of stuff, because someone videotaped them doing something that sometimes was misportrayed, misunderstood. So I just, I think I wanna start by saying, we are at a very sensitive and tender point in history where as nuance is lost, and as people are so firmly entrenched in their camps, it's almost like we kind of can't see one another. We can't uh, communicate, communicate. We can't see eye to eye. And, you know, perhaps you can jump in here and kind of redirect me if you want to. But I just I, I felt the need to start with that, because I think that even yeah. whether cancel so culture that, exists or not is is yeah, seems to well, be debated yeah i mean look that there's there is a there's a weird one of the one of the strange phenomenologies of the current day is people insisting that things that are axiomatic in reality don't exist and you start there by convincing people that no this doesn't exist this is something different it's never been different before we've now figured it out then once they've convinced people of that they build an ideology off it but reality has started to creep back in right so reality yeah. is now coming in and people are going, wait a minute, that's not. So so I'm gonna go back to the borderline process because I, I really had not given that enough careful thought because you're right. I thought I was seeing all really stark black, white thinking, but you're right. I think that good, bad, good mom, bad mom thinking of the borderline process is really what we have going on here. And it immediately connects me to a history that I saw evolve. So I started working at a psychiatric hospital in 1985. And in by the late 80s, I noticed that all the character pathology started heading into cluster B. It was not like that in 1985. It was A, B, C, it was all over the place. And then all of a sudden it started going into B. And then by the 90s, you never saw anything but cluster B. And I was <laughs> yeah. reflecting recently, but here's what's interesting. Every single borderline patient that came in the patient and came in the hospital had a minimum of twenty lawsuits under his or her belt. A minimum, every single one. So, in a way, the legal and the legal system finally caught wind of this, and lawyers started kind of going, "Come on, all right, all right." And then they started putting things in place, anti-slap laws and things like that, to prevent this frivolousness from continuing. But in a way. It's the, it's the borderline rage that was acted out through the court that's now being acted out. I thought it was narcissistic rage, but I think you may be right. It might be borderline rage that's being acted out through cancel culture. Is that accurate? I 
think so. I mean, I, I think it's really important for us to just take a brief moment to kind of unpack our terms for people because non-clinicians yeah. might have no idea what we're talking about when we say something like cluster yeah. B. And, you know, so yeah. it's, it's amazing how the, the books are always changing and now we don't even have clusters anymore. But in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the official tome of diagnoses, there are what we call cluster B personality disorders, which is narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, and histrionic personality disorder. And the reason why I just want to take a moment to sort of explicate that for people is because clinically speaking, I think that there can be a lot of overlap between these things. And culturally speaking, I think that we are living through a point in history where all three of those things are a little flared, right? That there is, a, there is an inherent narcissism to American culture. It comes with it a certain amount of black and white thinking, which we sort of see in the mm -hmm. more borderline dynamics. And then we also have the histrionics mm -hmm. of everybody having very big feelings right now. And it's all yeah. three of those things kind of layered on top yeah. of one another, kind of like a cake. Yep. Yep. No, I 100% agree. And, and sort of, and sort of the way I've been talking about it lately, I've, I've been sort of emphasizing the narcissistic part. But you're right. I'm seeing. I didn't. I didn't anticipate the histrionic piece, which has been astonishing to me that, that we got there. But we have been there. Me too. And it's not. It's not. And it. And it's not that even though I mentioned that we were seeing those disorders, that's really not what you and I are talking about. You and I are talking about traits. These traits that are sort yes. of pervasive in the culture, and and traits are not all bad or all good. Traits are traits and, and they are adaptive in certain situations and in other, they have liability associated with them. Like I always say is that if you have a fighter pilot, I want that person to be highly narcissistic. I want that person to feel invincible. I want that. And I, and if I were involved romantically with that person, eh, there could be some problems, but maybe not. Maybe I'd like, I mean, the, the point is these are not good, bad kinds of things. They are liabilities that come with traits and the thing that you know you and I suspect will focus on is the delusionality, the envy, and the empathic failure. Those are the things I worry about. Are there other things you worry about? Oh no, I mean I, I see a lot of hysteria in our country right now, and perhaps a little yes, bit across absolutely. the world, which is just another way yeah, of absolutely. saying you know the, the histrionic piece of things. I think yeah. Um, yeah, I think all of this it's it all goes together in a sort of a terrible way. But yeah, I'm I'm happy to take that wherever you want to go. Any of those things. Well, my my constant refrain is because I see it and I saw it coming and I see it. I don't know how we get out of it. My, I, I ask everybody that I interview or and that I feel has got knowledge, you know, in this area, like how long is it going to last and how are we getting out? <laughs> That's all I care about. We're here. Great. How do we get through this? How do we get out of this? And how, you know, what do you imagine much the way I saw it coming? I wonder if you see where it goes. I don't, I, I don't, it's the, the, the degree to which this happened sort of surprised me. Yeah, I don't. I don't see a clear way out. There's really only one antidote that I personally can think of, which is exposing people to information that helps them to maybe open their perspective a little bit and see things differently. And it's it's one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of your work. It's one of the reasons why I think that you and I have a lot in common in the way that we think. You know, I have my podcast specifically so that I can help people understand the world they live in a little bit better. And it's kind of a tall order and a tall task right now, but I think I'm a really big believer in the idea that the only real antidote is information. You know, we just sort of have to give people a new way to think about this stuff. So perhaps you and I can try to do that together today. A hundred percent. So, so my sort of approach to that, well, you could only just now begin to talk about this in, in ways without being sort of getting these weird backlashes. Uh, and so my, I feel like my task is to bring reality in, like reality testing is off. And so let's just talk yes. about what we do know, what is real. And just, I, I mentioned to you before the mics heated up that I had tweeted something today, a study from Johns Hopkins. It was a couple month old study, but it, it showed it was a very good study. And you can argue about meta analyses and their accuracy, but this was a damn good study out of Johns Hopkins. And it shows that, that lockdowns only harmed and did not affect mortality really at all and it harmed millions of people and so my, and my thing is like if it showed it worked i'd be very in favor of doing these things but i knew they didn't work at the time i knew they wouldn't work and here's the data now it didn't work and people push back and they go what are you what are you supposed to do well what you're supposed to do 
is something that has an evidence base to it. Let's do things that are yeah. real. So how would you address yeah. that? Oh man, it's such a good and a big question. I mean, I just, I wanna start by letting you know how much I agree with you and I'll give you a statistic that is uh, <laughs> slightly alarming and I think is really gonna speak to you, Drew. There are lots of ways that we can parse this data because we can look at it nationally, we can look at it internationally, we can look at it sort of with different individual municipalities. In the city of San Francisco alone, if we use that as a, a reference point, between 2019 and 2020, there was a 59% increase in deaths by drug overdose. And in the year 2020 alone, three times as many people died of a drug overdose than died of COVID. Right. Now that I'm is, I can tweet, tweet out the link later if people want me to. Yeah. That was that data I found in the, uh, an article in the San Francisco Chronicle. <laughs> I think that is a really good example of how the lockdowns not only didn't appear to work, we now have the data in retrospect, they appear to have done a lot of harm. And for people who aren't addiction experts, because you and I both are, I'm also an addiction expert, it might feel like, I don't know, maybe that's a coincidence or something like that. I don't think it's a coincidence at all. I think no. human beings are no. not meant to live in that kind of isolation. And for people that were vulnerable, there was a really, really, really bad impact. So I feel similarly, you know, I, I look out at the landscape of the world right now, after two years of this pandemic, I look at the data that we currently have access to. It would appear that a tight fitting N95 mask will protect the person that is wearing it. Uh, yep. You know, they, they don't need the other person to also be wearing it. No. Nope. So if somebody nope. is immune, <laughs> so if somebody and, is and, immune compromised, and, mm -hmm, you first. Okay, and it doesn't prevent you from transmitting to someone else. It protects you. Not, not only exactly. do you not need another person to have the mask, you're not helping anybody else. You're helping yourself with the N95, yes. and that's that. And if you would like to, if you're concerned and you need that coverage, you should wear that N95. You should not ask anybody else to wear it unless, you know, unless you're concerned about their health. I exactly. And I, I, you and I are totally on the same page about that. I think that we need to enter a phase of things where people are encouraged to protect themselves in the way that they think is appropriate. And we need to stop with these sort of mask mass mandates that have everybody engaging in these. Um, I mean, I think a lot of it is it's hygiene theater. It's it's it is more theater than 100%. it actually is protecting people. Yeah. We, we, we know that, so we know lockdowns don't work. We know that mass masking, two large studies, that data has been opened up and culled through. We know mass masking doesn't work. We know N95 protect individuals. Again, here I am saying, well, we know that works, so you should do that if that's what you want to do. You should wear an N95 because we have data that that works. You should not wear a cloth mask to protect anybody else, period. Doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. again, just stay with what works. Now, what about what do you feel about uh, Philadelphia going back now to indoor masking, apparently, because they've had a little BA2 surge? Well, I found out about it just before we went live. So I'm going to have to just sort of, you know, speak off the top of my head here. But I, I just can't help but feel like I'm not sure that we have the political will to do that any longer. You know, it's, it's on again, it's off again, we've been going back and forth. I, there's one, I'll, I'm going to interrupt myself quickly to say something that feels important, but I think what I hope the viewers and listeners of this will notice in the way that you and I are speaking with each other is that there's a lot of nuance in the way that we're talking, right? We may be sort of saying that, um, you know, that the lockdowns didn't work, that, you know, having everybody in masks does not, is not, is not necessary and doesn't work. We're not saying that COVID isn't real, right? And I think one of the things no. that's been really tough with the hysteria that we have lived through is that there are these, you know, there's this unbelievable polarization, right? Where it's hard for people to meet in the middle. So I just want to point out to people that you and I are meeting in the middle right now by talking in a way that I personally believe is informed by facts. Um, and I just think that... Um, I think that we've got to move forward in a way that gives people more of an individual sense of protecting themselves in the way that they want to. I mean, I, I'm glad I don't live in Philadelphia. I, I live in Los Angeles. I hope they don't go back to masking here, but I guess we're just going to have to see what they do. 
Yeah, the, the hysteria. So let's be clear. So we are, we're saying you should wear an N95 mask if you want to protect yourself. We're saying you should take vaccines unless you have some. And if you have questions, work it through with your doctor. Uh, we are mm -hmm. saying, uh, you know, that COVID is nasty. And in particular, if you're in a risk category, you have a 5,000 times probability, higher probability of dying at 85 than 17. Recognize those differences. Um, therapeutics are rapidly progressing. With that. We just yesterday, a, a clinical trial was stopped on a new drug. I always have to remind myself of the name of it. Let's see if I can get it. Oh, shoot. I don't think I have it anymore. Oh, wait, I do. Hold on. It's really look good. It actually interferes with the assembling of the viral particles and works on the cytokine storm at the same time. It's sort of a miracle drug. And it is called Sabazabalin, <laughs> like Abazaba, Sab <laughs> Sab Sab Sabazabalin. And it's oral. And it's going to, it, that and Paxlovid and Molnupiravir, these things... These things make this a non-threatening thing, and and I knew mm -hmm. I knew American medical research would come up with these things. I I just knew it, and, and so here we are, and so it's making it less of a thing. So to become hysterical about it, it, it doesn't really make sense. Uh, I, I, and I, and well, a part of it is what we've sense. done to people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what what is it? What is it about the hysterics? Is is it gratifying in some way? I I you know one of the personality disorders I understand the least is histrionic. I got to admit. And so when people get hysterical, I get I get kind of confused. Is it is it gratifying or something? Perhaps a little bit. I think more so. Um, I feel like it's a real reaction to. To, to news and information, which is to say that it's it's kind of a response to the media. You know, we live in mm -hmm. a country that has a, a really messed up relationship with its media, N your yep. show not included. But if I think about things like, you. you know, the major networks, CNN, Fox News, this kind of stuff, we are in a really unique position in this country where there are profit motives around the news that other countries don't experience in the way that we do. And it amps up the fear and the hysteria and the emotion, because if it bleeds, it leads. And mm -hmm. there are profit motives in keeping people scared. And I think it's really interesting mm -hmm. to see that the hysteria, so to speak, really in many ways has been on both sides, because on the liberal side and the left side, you have people that are so afraid of COVID that people, I've seen people literally hiking alone by themselves in the woods with a mask on, you know, because apparently they could get COVID from the trees. But then on the right, you've got people that are, you know, afraid that their freedom is going to be taken away. And that becomes its own right. form of hysteria. Chips. And it Chips just feels like yeah, that kind of stuff, you know, and it's, it does lead to a certain level of paranoia. And more on, on, again, on both sides, just paranoia about different things. And I think a lot of it has to do with the information that people are being fed. It has to do with where they get their news from, who it is that they trust and who it is that they believe. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I, although, although I do feel like they somehow were tilling fertile soil. <laughs> somehow we were set up for this a little bit. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, I think yeah. we've. I think we're seeing a couple different things come together right now. A lot of it has to do with social media and the way that it creates bubbles. And there are all of these ways in which, you know, people's emotions are played with. And that's the thing that's interesting about you know what you were saying about the hy hysteria and the histrionics. It does not make rational sense, but it's not rational. It's emotional, and I think people are just really scared. You know, we're living at a point in history where people are really afraid. The other thing is, I, the other thing I saw was sort of the death of math, uh, death of numbers. I, <laughs> I had a bad case of, uh, really, because people either weren't educated or don't understand probabilities or, but I, I, when I had, I had a bad case of COVID and everybody I talked to started with, were you scared? And I thought, wh why would I be scared? I had a 1% fatality rate with this thing at my age, 1%. When a doctor tells you you have a 99% probability of getting through, he or she is telling you that's 100%. Yeah, you, you might as well buy a lottery ticket with that 1%. We'd, we'd mean it's going to be fine. Relax. And and people think, and there's data that shows this, that people who watch certain news organizations thought the hospitalization rate was a 60% and the fatality rate was 30% for, for mm -hmm. a middle-aged person. It, it couldn't be farther from that. I think a lot of that has to do with the way the information was packaged for people. You know, 
you have access to that data in a way that's really clear for you because you're a medical doctor. So you're not just good at math, you understand the science. You can, you know, you can read the literature yourself. You can comprehend it. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of major news organizations that kind of have to take a certain amount of responsibility for the fact that the news was delivered for people in a way that was really fear mongering. And again, they did that oh, yeah. because it, they made money from it. Pure and simple. Right. Yes, I, I agree. And and you, I want to tell you a quick story. I believe I've told on this thread more than once which is that I, for some reason, remember very vividly seeing a news magazine show in the 1970s, sort of a Nightline 2020 or, or 60 Minute thing where a reporter was in Russia reporting on Pravda, which was the Soviet news you know, outlet, and they were looking at the Pravda television station. And there was one anchor every night that just delivered the Pravda news with you know the monotone and the, and it was all, it was all, you know, written by the government. It was all government controlled. And the reporter started really pushing on the anchor, the Soviet anchor, going, how can you, you know this isn't true. This is the government giving, feeding us. Now, how is that journalism? And finally he stopped them. I don't know why this stayed with me, but it's very relevant to the present moment. He stopped them and he said, hey, in our country, news is a political enterprise. In your country, it's a commercial enterprise. Just different priorities, but trust me, you'll be as distorted with that priority as we might be with our political priority. And look at us now. Look at us now. Here, here. I've, I've been thinking about that a yeah. lot lately, where we can look at different parts of the world and we can see the way Russia is manipulating its information right now. We can see the way yep. China manipulates its media. I think what's far less clear to us is the way that we are manipulated by our own media. It, it, I, and again, the, the really, I'm hoping the theme that emerges from our conversation is the theme of reality creeping in. Like reality is coming back. Reality, people are tired of trying to swallow notions that don't seem real to them or seem distorted or seem processed or seem commercialized. They're sort of starting to think for themselves. And one of the, one of the really interesting examples of that for me is Shanghai right now, right? So to me, you know, the, what the Chinese Communist Party are doing in Shanghai is bizarre and doesn't work. And I, it makes you shake your head, go, why are they doing that? Even with their zero COVID intentions, there's zero probability of a zero COVID world. So what are they doing? Why are they doing that? I don't know. But what's interesting to me is not that. What's interesting to me is I don't believe, I don't see a difference between what they're doing in Shanghai and what they did in Wuhan during the original outbreak. And when the original outbreak in Wuhan occurred, we had national press in this country, not infectious disease experts, press mandating that we follow the policies of the Chinese Communist Party and do something that had never been contemplated ever before in the history of medicine, locking down a country or a state. This has never been thought. It's quarantines are localized. Quarantines are localized with contact um, uh, testing. You know, you contact, you check the contacts and you locally quarantine. You don't quarantine, you don't quarantine healthy people. Never in medical, well, it was one time it was done in Venice during a plague outbreak and it was a catastrophe. That was the only other time in the history of medicine that there had been large scale lockdowns of healthy people. It doesn't work. We've always known that. But because that's what they did in Wuhan, literally we had the editorial board of the New York Times demanding that we have a national lockdown. You know, you mentioned the, you said something else, you had another uh what did you talk about anyway i, I have a, actually have a powerpoint with all this stuff on it you know you mentioned oh you mentioned the san francisco drug addiction death I, that's on my powerpoint so but that and now Got we're it. looking at shanghai and going now we're looking at shanghai and going oh man that, that that what are they doing well what they're doing is exactly what you insisted we do and you better take a good look at that that that's what's interesting to me that we did that and now we're standing back in judgment of the chinese communists going well how could you possibly do that you're like, how horrible yes how horrible you guys insisted on the same thing two years ago isn't that interesting that is, it is very interesting to me and i never thought about it that way i thought that we had something a system that kind of resembled this during the 1918 flu pandemic did we not did were we only quarantined no nothing no 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 oh my god it, 
I have a PowerPoint, everybody. If you'd like to hear my lecture, I have a whole PowerPoint. On this. I have all the. I have. Uh, it was. It was only discussed locally as as the outbreaks would occur. Then you can look at the newspaper articles in Chicago and San Francisco and in the Philadelphia, and they never ever they put all the sick soldiers in you know, those pictures and the those sheets up and they're in long lines of bed that was the quarantine they took the sick people and they put them in quarantine that's the quarantine then they had long discussions about masking and the fundamental position that everybody took was we can't do that that's a, that's un-american you can't do that and it doesn't work so why would we do something as draconian and by the way no one would put up with it well here we are here we are Interesting. amazing Amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's really wild to think about what this country has been through and across the world, across the world, but I'm thinking specifically in the United States over the course of the past couple of years. I, I, I hope we have a I, lot I of traumatized people about. right now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Same yes. Here. Think about it. Don't let it happen again. Think about what happened. Think really, really remember the history. People that don't, you know, remember the history are doomed to repeat it. And so it, it is, it has been a very acute and, and here, here's another piece. And again, because you and I are having a nuanced conversation, let me add to this at the beginning. I was actually supportive of lockdown. I didn't think it was the right thing to do, but I, I thought our leaders were in very tough situation and they're trying to anticipate the worst and uh, give them some time to figure it out. Okay. In fact, I had, although, although the school shut down, I thought was a bridge too far. And just today, uh, I was talking to my friend Adam Kroll and we pulled up a video of me talking to a school board member in March of 2020, the night before they shut the schools down here in LA County. And, and I asked the guy, I said, who is the infectious disease expert that told you to do this? And you know, he said to me, he goes, well, we have lots of doctors in our, in our, amongst our school board, amongst our members. I said, who decided this? Where did you hear this? Did the C it's exactly contrary to what the CDC was saying at the time. Don't close schools. Why are you doing something different than the CDC? Why are you doing this? Uh, uh, we just going to do it for two weeks while we figured things out. Two years later, two years later, yeah. they were still closed. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't know what, what they were doing. They... I'll just tell you what breaks my heart is seeing kids play outdoors with masks on. I've seen it Crazy. here in Los Angeles in the baking Crazy. heat, a bunch of elementary school oh. kids running around. I mean, it's just like, what have we done to our children? What have we done? Well, that's the next question I'd like to know. What have we done? What are you seeing? I know what we, we discussed some of this yesterday. We were seeing anxiety, depression, anxiety, depression, anxiety, depression. I feel like we particularly sacrificed sort of eight to 15 year olds, but what, what are you seeing? No, I feel the same way. My, my heart really goes out to, to kids in that age range, because I think something that I just want to really break down for our listeners, because we can kind of talk clinician to clinician here, but you know, it is unbelievable how much human beings need human contact. It, we are mm, here, a here. very social, we are a very social species, yeah. far more yep. so than I think a lot of people realize. And it was a problem before the pandemic that, you know, the United States is a very isolation oriented, you know, very individualistic country. We have a lot of problems. We've been having a lot of fallout for a long time, you know, even with things like gun violence in this country, I think is very much so a result of how isolated and lonely a lot of people are. And then we took a bunch of, you know, teenage, preteen and teenage children that are really at their peak of needing social contact. And we made them all go home and get on the internet. And to the extent that I have my finger on the pulse of what's happening with kids that age, I think it's really heartbreaking. They're really, really struggling. And they're really struggling because, quite frankly, I think we have to take responsibility as adults. We have failed them. You know, it's not, it was never, mm -hmm. being on Zoom is not a, a valid proxy for human to human interaction in person. You know, it doesn't, we're not going to get the same oxytocin from it. We don't, we don't get the health benefits from interaction when we are relating to people online in the same way that we do when we can give somebody a hug, you know, or hang out with them in the real world. And um, those kids are really having a hard time. 
Valid proxy. I love that. It is not a valid proxy for school. What what are other than the I, and we talked yesterday with a psychologist who was saying that kids actually don't know how to behave in school anymore. They don't know how to function. You know, they've moved mm -hmm. forward two years without the usual milestones and developmental processes. And they have peers that are now two years older, too. And they literally don't know how to behave. They don't know how to connect their previous friends are not their friends. I mean, think of that. I mean, particularly kids that are going from childhood to puberty. I mean, it's just it's just insanity. And then the educational delay, uh, what, who knows if that will ever be, be made up. What else happened as a result of sending them out into the internet, do you think? Mm, what else happened? God, it's hard to say. I mean, I think that um, one way of thinking about this is to say that they appear to be kids that age experiencing kind of epidemic levels of uh, anxiety and depression. And yeah. I think one of the things that really worries me about the world that we live in, and I would love to hear any thoughts you have about this, Drew, is just that I think far too many people think that something like depression is a result of a chemical imbalance, pure and simple. You know, there are a lot of people that take antidepressants in this country, even though what they're actually struggling with is an absence of quality relationships. Um, they're dealing with, you know, epidemic levels of stress, trauma, economic strain, all of these things. And my intention is not to be down on antidepressants. That is not my soapbox. It's more so that I think we oftentimes look to the wrong solution for our mm -hmm. ills. And I think that depression and anxiety in this preteen and teen cohort that we're talking about right now is a really good example of how, you know, it's not our biology that changed in the past two years, right? It's our, it's our environment. It's our socializing or lack thereof. And I think that there are a lot of things that we've got to do to support these kids. But one of them is to get, you know, one thing is to get them back into contact with one another. The only way they're going to figure out how to socialize with one another again is by yeah, doing it. That's right. Figuring yep, it out together, yep. as and awkward to, as it may be. Without, and without a mask, so they can read you know, affective expressions, and which are, I, I think a lot of people don't understand that we, we read minuscule movements in our facial musculature. It's packed with information. And when you remove half the face, you're removing all that information. And by the way, part of that receptive information is information about who I am and how to regulate my emotions, and as well as who, who somebody else is. And that's fantastically complex. In fact, the uh, dementia specialists I talk to always tell me, you know, remember, you know, people are advised to use crossword puzzles and stuff like that. And I go, what, what is the best way to stimulate the brain? They go, oh, nothing gets close to social interaction. It's the most complicated things human do. And that is what the dementia patients need to sustain their, sustain their cognition to, to the extent that they can. Um, I, I'm realizing as I talk to you, <clears throat> I'm trying to tune into my own stuff. Um, I'm having trouble coming out of this um, because for me, I, I was very aware of the social, you know, the, the meaning making and the meaning making with others. You know, we, we need to be of service to others. We need to experience our you know, self emerges in a relational context. Let's face it. I mean, that's what self is, is a relational thing. Uh, and so I, I knew this would be disastrous, but, and, and it was bad for me, but there's some, I'm having trouble there's another piece that I wasn't aware of, and I'm not sure I can fully articulate it, but I would sort of put it under the category of enterprise, like you know, it, building things with other people, doing things with other people that are exciting and fun. I, I feel like I have a giant deficit in that, and, and I'm nervous that it's going to get taken away again, or I'm not going to be able to do it anymore, or something. There's some sort of weird PTSD around building and doing, you know, meaning making and building is sort of the thing I think it's sort of Viktor Frankl type type stuff, but doing it with others. I, I, it, it, I have a hard time putting my finger on what I'm experiencing, but I'm aware that it's, it's troubling me. And I'm, I don't, I doubt I'm alone. I doubt I am. Oh, you're not alone at all. I mean, what I just yeah. can't help but think about hearing you say that is, you know, you 
create so much content in the world. And it's interesting to think that over the course of the past couple of years, you have been doing that largely in a vacuum. Now, it's sort of interesting to think that you have Susan helping you with a lot of it, which is a huge advantage. Not everybody has that. But it kind of reminds me of, we we have a colleague named Jonathan Shedler, who I know. And one of the things that he has commented on that I really like is that in the same way that we have driven people apart from one another, we have also strained certain relationships by making it so that um, we have been sort of overusing certain key relationships in yes. our lives. So, for example, yes. you know, for any yes. married couple out there, they have been spending too much yeah. time with their partner. And it's funny because, you yeah. know, I get the sense that you have a very strong relationship with Susan. It, but it's regardless, you know, people need variety in life and to not be yeah. spending so much time only yeah. with one, yeah. one person, two people. Mm-hmm. You, you, we used to. I, I've seen this happen in relationships that are strained long before COVID, where people demand that that other person meet all their needs. <laughs> you can't. You yes. can't. You can't do that to another person. You yeah. can't do that. It's not okay. Mm-hmm. And and I think I don't do that. But but I, you know I don't know where her balance is on that. Don't, you know she's not here today, but she mm-hmm. could talk about that. And and you're mm-hmm. right. I'm used to big productions with lots of people and all sorts of interaction. And I just did that last weekend. I was in a teen mom reunion, and it felt odd. It was bizarre, and it and it felt like something that was going away. It felt like something that was just like, mm, I'm not sure this kind of thing is going to be here much longer. But maybe that's just my PTSD oh, talking. Pa, yeah. I hope so. I hope so. It feels to me like the world yeah. is reemerging. Do you, do you feel that at all? Like well, the world is reemerging? Oh yeah. Oh, oh, a hundred percent. I, I feel mm-hmm. not only emerging, I feel like you can start to talk again. You can start to say things. You can start to offer your opinions and, and not fear that you're going to be destroyed for offering an opinion. And like I said earlier, I feel reality is creeping in. And that's the thing I've been looking for the most is I don't like, I, I, I feel like my mental health is dependent on you know understanding reality and reality's terms and when everyone around you denies reality it it it's crazy making but i gotta take a quick break you and i are going to come back with some more calls where do you want people to go uh leslie to to find you follow you where would you like the podcast yeah they can the nature of nurture is available in every podcast app and i'm at dr leslie carr on twitter and instagram Perfect. And also LeslieCarr.com. Is that another place they can find you? Yep. LeslieCarr.com. Yep. Two R's. All right. We'll be right back after a very quick break and take some calls. Let me take a minute to tell you about Blue Mics. Over the two years we've been working with our friends at Blue Mics, the world has completely adapted to working and meeting virtually. So whether you know it or not, you probably spent a lot of time in front of a microphone. Take it from someone who has spent probably half my life on a microphone. Sounding good is extremely important. And because of blue mics, I have never sounded better. But a good mic isn't just for broadcasting. Quality audio makes a big impact on whomever is listening on the other end, from coworkers to clients to friends. Clear sound can make all the difference. Thanks to blue mics, you don't need complicated or expensive equipment to get professional results. For simple plug-and-play setups, try blue mics Yeti series. It plugs right into your USB port on your computer. Need something more robust? Blue's got an entire line of professional XLR mics like the Mouse or the Blueberry we use here in our studio, as well as the more compact Encore 300. I love it for clear quality sound when we travel. Bottom line, there is no excuse to be the one on the conference call who sounds like you're in a tunnel or underwater. I cannot say enough about Blue Mics, and once you try one, you will never go back. To take your audio to the next level, just go to drdrew.com blue. That is drdrew.com slash B-L-U-E. So uh, Margaret Campbell, I don't know if you're on the restream thread. I see somebody talking to you there. Um, But I need to know if you would like me to address the questions you uh, sent me through locals. Uh, I, uh, Dr. Carr and I could address it here if you'd like us to. And you may have to say yes a couple of times here because I, I only catch a certain amount of this this thread here. Um, so we'll see. It's really, she has a question about trauma. <clears throat> and, you know, of course, sexual trauma leads to all kinds of things. And we, it's, it's a precursor to all kinds of dysregulation, all sorts of behavior. She was asking, for instance, things like, um, the topic such as do people go into the sex injury they've been sexually traumatized very commonly happens a lot 
Uh, same, and you see porn addiction very commonly when people have sexual traumas uh, or sex addiction of various types or sexual anorexia. Obviously, if you've had been traumatized around sexuality, it can affect your behaviors in adulthood. And I wonder if you want to add anything to that, Leslie. Um, no, I don't know if she has a question that's more specific than that. I can't think of anything that I would yeah. add. Um, you know, certainly the types of trauma that we've been focusing on today are a little bit different than that, but that's a very significant kind of yeah. trauma too. Yes. And, and you, is your, do you, do you focus, do you also study childhood trauma as well as these other mm -hmm. more, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That, Particularly just, yeah. you know, sort of early developmental stuff. Yeah. So uh, attachment ruptures, that kind of thing, abandonment, attachment, yeah. attunement, all of that stuff. Do you have any um, special? Uh, oh, Steve, I'm looking for you again now. There you are. Uh, do you have any uh, special proclivity for any particular researchers or writers on the topic that we can refer people to? Oh, that's such hang a on, good, Steve. I'll be right with um, you. Sure. Sure. Such a good question. Let me think really quickly. I know I just I just said the name Jonathan Shedler, who's a voice I really like on this topic. People can find him on Twitter. He's really active. Um, he's the only person Russell I can Vanderkoek. think of off, off the top of my head. But, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, big fan Russell of his Vanderkoek. work. The body most certainly uh, does keep the uh, score, doesn't it? Alan Shore. I'm not familiar with him. No. Nope, Peter Fonagy. Peter Fonagy, yes. I'm also the name David Wallen is coming to mind. He wrote a book called Attachment and mm -hmm. Psychotherapy, which is brilliant. Um, Fantastic. Uh, Levine, yeah. Waking the Tiger. Is that one you just throwing Peter stuff Levine? out there? Yeah. Peter Levine, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm not as familiar with his work a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you think of anything I, uh, else, let me know because I'm, I'm always that, that stuff. I, when that stuff uh, started, started happening and people started putting the pieces together on the neurobiology of all this, I, I became a fanatic because it answered so many questions, so many questions. Yeah, you know, there's one thing that I'll add that might sound a bit self-referential, but in the first episode of the second season of my podcast, I interview a colleague of mine named Stephanie Pass, and she's a child psychologist, and she just talks really brilliantly about some of the ruptures that create challenges for children and what it's like when children need to go to therapy, oftentimes even when they're really young, you know, she does a lot of what we call dyadic work where it's, you know, it'll be very children as young as two in conjunction with their primary caregivers so that you can kind of figure out mm. what is going wrong there and how to fix it. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. She's a brilliant mm -hmm. voice on this topic. Um, if I can pass, think of anything P-A-S-S? -S? I'll let you know. P-A-S-S, -S, yes. All right. That's, that's the ass. kind of stuff I'm looking for. Okay, Steve, you're back. Steve, mm -hmm. what's going on? Hi there. Hey. Um, Drew, good to talk to you. You too. Dr. Carr, um, thanks for your perspective on this. And I, I, I love the issue. I've got a question for you. It, you know, it, it's, it's talking about what I hear you all talking about is psychological warfare. Mm -hmm. And it's almost uh, psychological warfare at a level we've never seen in human history. And I think... This week was very interesting because I think this week may be studied for decades or even centuries, things that have happened this week uh, in Shanghai. Mm. You know, five or six years ago, I called Drew and uh, we talked a little bit about the Holodomor uh, in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, and I forget what it was in reference to five or six years ago, but it, it was a case study uh, in genocide and, and to some extent psychological warfare. And what's happening in Shanghai right now where you have 25 million people locked down, mm -hmm. starving, uh, under the guise of COVID, uh, when it has nothing to do with COVID, uh, you know, we're going to have to see how this turns out. Um, it's not being reported on very much, but what I'm wondering is, is it really, you know, are the discussions that we need to be having now more about COVID? Do we need to be having more dis you know, discussions about COVID? Or really, is this about control? Does this have anything to do with COVID at all anymore? Well. Um, I would refer you to my friend, Adam Carolla, who talks about exactly this all the time, Steve. And I, and I just told him today, sure. I just told him today, I said, look, I, I, I hear him say, I, every time I talk to him, he says something along these lines that you're discussing. And I say, I, I hear you saying it, but I, but I'm not accepting it. It may be true. I just can't accept it. And, and, and that may be my denial and I'm fully prepared to accept that. But it's also not my thing, you know what I mean? Like Dr. Carr and I, we were talking about 
impact on individuals and you know and relational things uh, to talk on a big scale like that i i gotta you know i have talked to a few people about it i will get him back we talked to a like um i talked to a a uh in from uh what was he he was adrian somebody's husband and he's adam at what was his name uh Caleb Adam Housley Adam uh Adam Housley who who does think about these things and does have real information about it and I just sit by and just think oh my god I, I can't believe it but okay I accept what you're telling me and I will we will try we had plans to get him back so I will try to get him back and that's way outside of my area of expertise but maybe you have something to say about it Dr. Carr maybe Leslie you're you're you think about these things well, there's one thing I'll add to this, you know, specifically to the question, you know, does it have anything to do with COVID at all anymore? I would argue that it does, you know, to me, part of what it means to kind of have a little bit more of a balanced, nuanced view of this is not to be kind of so far on the, on the end of conspiracy thinking, you know, what's happening in China and what's happening in the United States right now, they're very different things. So I'm not going to talk comment on Shanghai right now because it's a communist country. So there's a lot going on over there. I, but it's I exactly the, what we modeled our stuff after. No, I, I hear you, but maybe let me know what you think about this. I think when I look okay. at American leaders and the role that they have played in this, and this is, you know, at the executive level and then just individually in all of the different states and cities and counties around the country, I'm more inclined to look at it through the lens of those leaders also being human beings that are... Um, that fall prey to their own human vulnerabilities, their own anxieties, mm -hmm. coupled mm -hmm. with some of the pressures that they feel to do something about it, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I don't, I'm not a, um, yeah, you know, I think some conspiracies are real, but I'm, for the most part, I'm not inclined to believe that there's a puppet master in control of all of this stuff. I think it's more so human beings that are doing their best to make decisions and they are they have their own human vulnerabilities and anxieties too there, there was a strange phenomenon though that 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 has been sort of called trump derangement syndrome but there was this strange hysteria around him and it, it, whether you you know i don't care for or against i'm super moderate i you know i see the excesses everywhere uh, but I did see people becoming hysterical about anything he did and you, insisting on doing the opposite. Had to do, he said, mm -hmm. don't lock down, California locks down. And, and so I, I feel like that hysteria had something to do with this. It was very odd. It was very odd that only the opposite kept happening. And the, and, and the more the White House was saying, calm down, relax, it's gonna be okay, it's not so bad, I've had it, whatever the worse the hysteria got it it amplified and and it's, it's something to do with it not not that it was i'm not saying he was correct i'm not saying that by mm -hmm. any means but i'm saying that the response had such a over-the-top quality to it uh, and again pointing at wuhan pointing at italy going why aren't we doing what they're doing that's what we need to do how does it look now? How does that just think about it? How does that look now? Do you feel do you feel good about those decisions? Do you feel good in New York Times editorial board that you forced this issue? Journalists who never had ever contemplated or seen an infection before, just learned to speak the word hydroxychloroquine, just learned what uh, uh, what was the uh, other anti helminth medication that everyone was freaking out about. Help me get the I word, the, the, I, I, uh, the I word, ivermectin. You, you, I'd been using both those medications for decades, and you just learned how to speak the word, and you have a strong opinion about it. That's an that's hysterical. That's insane. That's insane. Mm -hmm. And and by the way, medicine got hysterical. Oh, so let me. Here's the thing I was just thinking about. I I see. Help me with this. Maybe you can. I follow a lot, a lot of different kinds of people on Twitter, and I was following a really fine pulmonologist who went berserk today, essentially, and of course, she, she knows how to treat COVID. She's seen the disasters in the ICU. That's what pulmonologists have done throughout this pandemic. But she suddenly went completely berserk about unmasking at school, that it was going to lead to mass deaths. And, and, and I thought, wow, wow am, am I missing something? Is there something in my positive bias, my cognitive biases, that, that I can't imagine saying something like that? And, and what, what, what am I missing is sort of what I keep thinking over and over again. Am, am I, do I just have 
uh, um, you know, I actually kept uh, one of the tweets from another fine epidemiologist from three weeks ago who predicted catastrophe in two weeks. And I'm going to retweet it in about a week and because I'm giving him a month. <laughs> let's see if it wasn't two weeks. Let's see if it was a month, whether things really got bad. I don't think they're going to. I think we have, we're, not, we're vaccinated enough. We've been exposed enough. We have great therapeutics. W where was it? I just read there was some city that had uh, 100,000 cases or something and zero deaths and zero hospitalizations because the, the therapeutics are so good. Uh, and so where do these, why, why still tr well-trained people running to one side of the boat so, so um, aggressively? What do you think that is? Well, I'll do my best to respond to that. I think, because um, I'm with you, it's sort of a strange reaction, right? It's sort of like you look at the data, children are the least vulnerable among us when, with COVID. But, you know, even intelligent, well-educated people have mental and emotional lives that run contrary to logic. And I feel like part of what it is that we're talking about right now is just the nature of fear, period, which is to say that when yes. there is a phenomenon that occurs where I think that people are fearful and they're anxious and then they look for something to affix that fear or that anxiety to. I think you and I are sense. like, yeah, you know, I think that you and I are perhaps both less congenitally kind of fearful people. I don't feel, I don't feel ruled by fear in my life. But I feel like a lot of what I've seen over the course of the past couple of years, and I, I think the past couple of years have been sort of a masterclass in mental health kind of writ large, is that a lot of people are scared and then they look for something to pin their fear on. And that is what I hear in what you're describing with this pulmonologist. I, th I think you're right. And, and and yet, I, I have an anxiety disorder, so fear is, is part of my, although right. I've been treated and treated. I shouldn't treated, be so, speaking for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, but 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 by the same token, the way I I have pretty good judgment, and so when I look, I I look at all the severe illnesses that are out there, and I think, yeah, this is one of them. This is a nasty one. But I had H one N one. I practiced actively during the AIDS epidemic and had thousands of AIDS patients that died because there was a hundred percent fatality of that. And then these were terrible. They were horrible, horrible experiences. Illnesses are bad. Infectious diseases are terrible. But but it's it's in a context. It's not the worst thing that's ever happened. It's not. It's just nasty. It's bad. It's really sad. And when these things come along, AIDS AIDS in my opinion was way worse. It was way worse. Yeah. Just sitting every day as a first year resident telling. 20 year old men, they were going to die in six months. And I was never wrong ever, ever, ever all day long. That's all we yeah. did. They'd come up with their yeah. first episode of pneumocystis. And we just say, sorry, there's nothing we can do. It's going to be, it's going to be six months. And, and th hundreds of thousands of people died that way with us yeah. able to offer nothing. It was terrible. It was terrible. And that was awful. And I, this was awful too. This was awful. Also, <laughs> it's not that it was good. This was awful. I, you know, this was a bad, bad pandemic. It was nasty we should stand I, um, up and keep moving forward. I, I, I think the thing that I marvel at, and it really fills me with a, lot, with a lot of sadness, is that we weren't able to learn from the AIDS crisis when it came to yeah. our public health messaging around COVID, right? Oh, you my know, God. A, oh, my yeah, God. Colleague named Bart McGee. I got to give Bart McGee a shout out. He's been saying that since the beginning because he he lived um, through the AIDS crisis in San Francisco, too. And, 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 saw a lot of people die during that period of time and became a psychologist as a result of that experience. And he's been saying that for a long time that it's, you know, I, it's like you see people hiking alone in the woods with a mask on when there's no one near them that could give them COVID. And it would be like counseling people, you know, to wear a condom all the time to protect against AIDS, right? Like it's just, yes. it's, there's a, we just, we, we couldn't, I don't know why we couldn't learn from that. Well, I, I, I've been saying it as well from the, from the, I completely agree with you because that's one of the, in AIDS, we had a very serious problem. We had to change a very powerful motivation state and change the behavior. And we made an entire study of it and we learned how to do it. And I did, the reason I got involved in radio was Dr. Fauci at the time was saying, you know, you got to get out there and educate. And it's the, and I thought, hmm, the best way to educate is with cases. We you know, callers come in with questions, just like we do here. People learn from cases and answering questions. That's how they really learn. And by the end of the 
you know, the sort of the middle of the AIDS epidemic, we learned that you that a doctor in a white coat sitting in a box telling you to do something didn't change much. And educating kids at school didn't change much. Here's what changed the behavior. A relatable source, somebody like you who's having this condition, a narrative uh, shows the consequences of good choices and bad choices, humor and music, that's it. You add humor and music, a narrative from a relatable source, think teen mom, that's why I got involved in that, that and it affected teen pregnancy in this country, it's been studied now. That's how you change behavior. You don't mm -hmm. rail on people and shame them and it, you, it, you, it just, it splinters everything. Do you agree with that? Uh, 100%, couldn't agree with it more. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? It's so crazy. That it, I, the whole time I was going, it's crazy. We're not doing what we look. Oh, an entire discipline developed around it. I don't know where those people were, but uh, they, you know, and by the way, we could have also been educating about how to use telemedicine and how, what a monoclonal antibody is and how to know when you're really sick and, you know, are you getting good enough care? When do you follow up with it? That they should have been educating on all that. So people who got sick didn't end up in the hospital. We could have done that. We did not. Oh, yeah. it just makes me sad I, and sick when I think about it. Same here. Right, and I Dawn, don't know why we haven't done a, okay. Oh, I'm, yeah, I don't know why we haven't done a better job of it and why we turn to weird fear declaring from on high and mandates. And it, it, it's, it's not only, I don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't get you where you want to go. It's not a health, it's not health, um, interventions it, it's some sort that of back to I that guy that say. asked us yeah that guy that was asking us about command and control it, it feels that's why it feels like it's just that because it isn't how you do it's never been how we've done public health i i don't know mm -hmm. uh dawn come on up here uh, laguna living i see you um i give i've clicked you and invited you to speak on the podium if you'd like to come up and ask your question um People often take a minute to get here. Anything else that you're interested in right now that I haven't been sort of touching on? Other topics that you think are important to get to? Um, you know, the last thing that, or, you know, one thing that is just kind of on my mind is encouraging people to nurture their relationships, especially their in-person relationships as, if they can. I think yes. that people, yes. people underestimate the power of their relationships to kind of to refuel totally them. Agree. And yeah. I think that we are at a kind of a crisis point in this country where the only way that we're going to get through it is if we do it together. And so I just, yeah. I really want to encourage people to, to like tend to their loved ones. And if they don't for any reason have loved ones, they've got to go find some, you know, whether they get a hobby, yes. whether they volunteer, you know, it's like we, we need community and we need it now really more than ever. So that's And, and I know thing. you have concerns that about the eco anxiety and what's that that's doing to kids too these weird mm -hmm. you know declarations of the end of the world that no scientist actually adheres to but they you know push that out there well i don't do know we do that i that? agree with that part drew i don't know that i agree with that part i think a lot of climate scientists are really sounding the alarm saying we've got to do things differently we've got to we've got to release our addiction to fossil fuels um mm -hmm. and so you know i think couple things I'll say really quickly about, about eco-anxiety. One is that I think that a lot of people are kind of afraid for the future of the planet for good reason. We have a lot of, you know, tremendous issue with plastic waste and, you know, again, a problem with fossil fuels we've got to get off of. But I think that um, this is a place where people can do a lot for their well-being with positive action in the sense that when push comes to shove, it is, you know, people that are in positions of power, the Exxon mobiles of the world and that kind of stuff that need to be reinvesting in, uh, in renewable sources of, of uh, energy, but they're only really going to do it if we put pressure on them to do it. And we do that by voting with our wallets. So, you know, if you are on a different side of the ideological divide here, I would love to hear more about that. But based on all of the research that I've done and to the extent that I have my finger on the pulse of this, I think that we do need to make a change. But the good news is that it actually is not too late. We just have to act now. We are running out of time to make a difference here, but we are not out of time. So, um, so here, 
the, what I was just saying was th there are, m much like there were people that believe that the probability of hospitalization from COVID is 60% when you're 35 years old, and it's actually like 0.3%. I, mm -hmm. I, I have never seen any climate scientists say the, the, the world is coming to an end, and yet I've heard lots of young people believe that to be true. So I just looked up the mm -hmm. 10 worst mm -hmm. possible predictions from climate change. So one is okay. some species become extinct, people have food insecurity, uh, coastal cities have water problems, get underwater, uh, migrations, uh, surging wildfires, let's see, hurricanes more frequent, uh, polar ice and permafrost, obviously, that's how the, the coastal cities get in trouble, uh, more pathogens, more and difficult pathogens, and dead coral. Mm -hmm. Those are the top 10 worst predictions uh, of climate change. Not that the world are coming to an end, not the human species is coming to an end, that we're going to be highly, highly, highly challenged. And we don't, mm -hmm. I don't want the corals to die, and I don't want more pathogens, and I don't want other species to become extinct. But it's, I, there's nobody that I have ever found that said, uh, watch out, we're coming to the end of the, the human species, or that there will be, you know, mass anything, uh, just problems, big, big, big problems. And, and that it may be too late. I've seen that too. Uh, that was from EcoWatch. Uh, let's see here. Here's a worst case scenario. Let's see what this is. Um, diseases, increased diseases are all the worst case scenarios. Um, but I don't, that's a highly speculative, highly speculative. Yeah. So uh, yeah. again, I, I just and want I, people to be realistic, back to reality coming in. You know, yeah, yes, sure. be anxious about it. Yes, do something about it. Yes, take action. And, and focus on the things you want to change. You want to save some species that are going to become extinct. Perfect. Focus on that reality. But don't focus on some free-floating anxiety that, that the news media caused you to have. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I think that that's true. I think one of the things that's really tricky about that list is that it doesn't have a lot of detail attached to it, right? So one of the things that I heard mm -hmm. is climate migration. And it's really interesting yeah. to think about what that may look like in the not too distant future. You know, I think we're at a point, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that kind of alarms me as a Gen Xer is that I remember being much younger than I am right now, thinking that we had plenty of time to figure this out. And over the course of the past couple of decades, it feels somehow like um, the deadlines keep keep moving closer to us, right? You know, I lived for 15 years until very recently in Northern California, where you know fire season is serious business up there. I mean, there's there can be sometimes a month or more of truly unbreathable air in Northern California mm -hmm. because the fires are so mm -hmm. intense. And I think where I just feel uh, like it's, this stuff is so tricky because it's almost like, how do you address it adequately? You know, you don't want a kind of climate denialism necessarily, and yet you also don't want to be hysterical about it. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's true that we're not, it's not like we are going extinct as we speak, but I think what a lot of people are worried about is future generations and what planet we're leaving them. And yes, I think it's fair to be concerned about and what that. Their mm -hmm. and, what th and what their struggles will be. Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, yeah. yeah. Um, absolutely. And we should, and we, there's no, nobody denies that, well, few people deny that we should be moving in a certain direction. It's just the, you know, Greta, Greta Thunberg said the humanity is coming to an end in three years. No, mm -mm. that's just not I happening. I have never heard that she uh, said that. Yeah, yeah. Somebody just quoted her on that here. Um, and maybe she was in a hysterical moment. Well, just, you know, <laughs> yeah, be, be careful where say, you oh, get hey. that from. If someone's just yeah. tweeting it or yeah. something, that might yeah, be apocryphal. Yeah, yeah, exactly for sure. Uh, but again, it, again, if you here's my thing: if you really, really want to do something about this, we should be highly focused on carbon capture. Uh, fusion, fission, these things that don't cause these carbon, we should be all about it. And if you're about w fixing climate and not about those things, why? Why won't you do the things that will fix it? And and mm -hmm. again, back to the forest fires, do you know that the forest fires last year will have done undone all the electrical cars that we've ever had on the California highways, completely undone the, the, the um, carbon savings. And most and I've talked to forestry people about this a lot, not most, a lot of the, the problem with the forest fires 
was the lack of forestry management. The federal government has not been doing it, and the state has not been doing it. We used to, I used to look up in the San Gabriel Mountains here, and they were crisscrossed with fire breaks when I was a kid. Yeah. Now you can't see a single fire break. Why? There was a mouse that had trouble migrating across the fire break, so it closed down all the fire breaks. Now you're mm -hmm. going to put carbon in the air. If you, 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 We have to make choices, hard choices, but we have to do forestry management if we're worried about the carbon we're putting in the air. So I, I just my thing is like, op be open to all of it. If you really want to solve the problem, you got to be open to all of it. Oh, well, we got I am Don up here. Don, with you. okay. Yeah, Don, go ahead and un unmute yourself. Sorry, we were just ta talking about something else, but go ahead. What's going on there, Don? Okay. Uh, hello, Doctor Drew. Hey, um, I just wanted to ask your opinion on masks in general. Mm -hmm. I was working as an esthetician in a high-profile resort in California, and recently just left my job because they went from you know, everyone had to be masked to then the vaccinated could, could go unmasked and then they changed it back again. And um, I, I just want to know your your views on any of the mass studies, if, if, if you really feel like they helped with the transmission or. Yeah. So I'll, I'll let Dr. Card address it first. So I'm don't, I don't lead the, the witness. We have discussed it a little bit already, but I'll let you explicitly give your opinion there. OK, well, yeah. Don, can you tell me specifically what your question is exactly? Say that one more time. Well, just, you know, the science kept changing where I worked between vaccinated and unvaccinated being masked or unmasked. So I finally left because it was causing such a segregation and it kind of led people to know whether you were vaccinated or not. And I'm just wondering if you feel like the masks really did slow down the spread or, you know, this, any mass studies that explain that further. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's so interesting because I feel like you you probably are better to better suited to address that science, Drew. I mean, it, it would appear okay. that N95 masks are the only thing that is actually effective at preventing spread. Correct. And, you know, right. I'm inclined to agree with what Drew said before, which is that it's it's the person who is wearing it that is being protected, not the other way Correct. around. So I don't I don't know yeah. if that sort of satisfies. So so, okay. so, so let me you're absolutely that's absolutely we're in agreement about that so don uh you know I, i'd refer you to dr monica gandhi uc san francisco infectious disease aids expert she's very up on this material i've interviewed her and we went over the bangladesh study and the danish study and the bangladesh study you know showed no effect of cloth masks and no effect of mass mask masking at all and uh, people t attacked it and said they hadn't evaluated the data properly. So they handed over the data to multiple organizations who culled through the data again and turned out it was even less effective than originally published in the original literature. So mass masking and particularly cloth masking has zero effect. Now, if it had any effect, I'd be all for it. Schools, there's a guy named Vinay Prasad who looked at those school studies and they were he he took them apart. I don't remember what his criticisms were, but they were mm -hmm. showing less outbreaks or less transmission where kids were wearing masks. It, it it there was I forget what the problem was with that study, but what did fall out of all the mass studies was that if you want to protect yourself, you can improve your odds by wearing N95 and that whole class of mask, that whole you know occlusive mask that that does okay. help the individual if you're interested in being protected you, you don't protect anyone else by wearing that mask so you don't protect other people but you do and and you don't need other people to be masked in order for that n95 to be effective for you right but well, if you can want, I, can go, I, ahead. go ahead uh, can i just tell you a quick uh, story about my my stepfather um attended the barrett jackson show here in Scottsdale. He's fully boosted, wore his N95, contracted COVID, gave it to my mother, and then blamed it on everyone else not having a mask on. So, mm. you know, it just it's just very confusing, and it's just, you know, a very frustrating it, it, it's, time. It's weird how people have this, there's a weird, much like there's a excessive belief that people are going to need hospitalization or going to die, which is rare in certain age groups, really rare. There's a similar weird belief that you're just you're just protected if you wear a mask and you're protecting right. everybody else, which is just not true. Which is not true. It has right. a nominal effect, if any. And if it That's, worked, I'd be all I for it. If, if the data here. said the other ways, if, if the data said anything else, I'd be I'd be excited. I'd be wearing a mask right now. I didn't like having COVID. Oh, 
Yeah. Caleb, I froze here. There we go. Yeah. Dr. Carr wants go. to jump in. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing to this conversation that feels really important is that it really is more about ventilation than it is about masks. I think one of the yes, problems with the yes. conversation yeah. around masks is that yeah. it made a lot of people think that they could mm. go into closed, enclosed environments with no ventilation. The mask alone would protect them when really there's just a fresh air issue with COVID where it's, you know, it's whether or not the air is trapped in an enclosed space. And that is the thing that I yep. wish a lot of people understood better. That's right. So, so when they put up those plastic barriers, that's making things worse, not better. It's the interrupting Certainly isn't flow helping. of air. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and yes, and it it essentially is non transmissible out of doors. Sunlight and moving yes. air prevent it from being transmitted. So, outdoor yeah. mask wearing is uh, bizarre. There, I, I only know of two cases of documented outdoor transmission, and in both cases, it was prolonged conversation to close contact. Uh, yep. So there you go. So I think you get it, uh, Don. You, so right? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Can I just ask one more question? Of course. And then I have a question for you. Um, okay. Because um, I read Robert F. Kennedy's uh, Kennedy Jr.'s book, and he discussed antibody dependent enhancement. And I just wondered if you had any viewpoints on that, because I've just I've seen a lot of my friends and uh, acquaintances who are fully vaccinated catching COVID. And I, I just wanted to know your viewpoint on that. Uh, Omicron is has no problem getting through the vaccine, but I can having seen many hundreds of cases, I assure you that the people there is a marked difference between vaccinated and unvaccinated and boosted and vaccinated. So, okay. so the, my, I nearly, I had an unvaccinated middle-aged man that almost died, a couple of those from Omicron, which was kind of extraordinary. Uh, my own son was boot, was vaccinated, but not boosted. And he got sick as hell. I saw lots of people boosted for one booster who had a cold. And I didn't see one person boosted who got really sick the way I saw my son get sick. And I saw those other two non-vaccinated individuals get sick. They really got sick. And so, and and by the way, I had profound frustration uh, getting getting the um, monoclonal antibodies and the Paxlovid. I couldn't get any of that at the time. Now, thank we can get some of that stuff again, uh, and we will hopefully have the uh, Abadab. What did I say? Abadabas ear. <laughs> Let me get the name one more times. Uh, there's a new medicine coming out that just looks amazing. Um, one second, I'll make sure everyone knows the name of it. Sabazabalin, Sabazabalin. Uh, but Don, why, why Laguna Life? Why Laguna Life? Yeah, where'd that come from? You live in Arizona. <laughs> why Laguna Life? Oh, I, I, I live in, I live in Laguna Niguel. Um, I'm, I moved there four years ago. I'm back here in Arizona visiting my son right now. I see. So it's. So I'm, I'm back and forth all the so time. So you're at uh, St. Regis or Montage or one of those places where the yeah craziness the broke right. out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my wife and I were married at the uh, Ritz in Dana Point. Oh, you so were! We have, and I was just there last weekend, so we have great, yeah, great affection. Beautiful for that place. place. Yes, indeed. So uh, nice talk to you, Don. Thank you so much for the question. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. You bet. You bet. Uh, okay, uh, I have to do a little clubhouse action there. There we go. Uh, so, all right. So, other issues that we might not have hit on, Leslie. I appreciate you so much coming here and talking about this, and it feels so good to have someone validating some of my concerns uh, and being able to talk about these. Particularly, it's hard. I, I can't find people that can talk about these characterological traits that are sweeping the land. And, 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 and we didn't talk about the fact that in reality, um, the reason we have so many traits is because of all the childhood trauma and ruptures. That's why we're in yeah. the condition we're in, right? Do you want to talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I think people don't really know that. Sure. Yeah, you know, I was just sort of thinking similarly, Drew, that it's really rare for me to be able to chat with a clinician that can see the way these trends play out on a mass scale. Um, so I really appreciate that as well. And I think that there are a couple of things going on. I think there certainly is childhood trauma that's playing itself out in people's adult lives. I think that there also are some cultural factors, like the way that we use social media or... Um, the, the value that we put on celebrity in our culture, I think a lot of it comes from macroeconomic trends that make it so that the vast majority of Americans just have a really hard time getting by, you know, that big study that came out 
think it was a, a little over two years ago now that the average American doesn't have $400 in savings to in case of an emergency or something like that, you know? And the reason yeah. why I bring up the money is because it distorts everything. There are a lot yeah. of young people today that are trying to become famous on social media because they can't see a better, um, more solid path to economic prosperity for themselves. So the mm -hmm. entire culture mm -hmm. gets warped around seeing and being seen and that kind of stuff. And so, you know, childhood trauma plays a role too, but I think that there's also a lot of cultural stuff that is not healthy for people. Yeah. I, do you, uh, I have a, a friend of mine, a psychologist, we've interviewed her on this show before, who does a lot of digital safety and she only allows her kids on, on, uh, digital media. I don't think she allows them a social media account, but she allows them out there one hour a day and that's it. I, I think that it's smart that and camp? I think that, uh, yeah, you know, what I worry about the most is really young children. There are a lot of people that will pacify their very, very young children by giving them screens. And I think they mm -hmm. do not realize the harm they're doing because all of that ability to sort of develop frustration tolerance and that kind of stuff is um, getting lost in the, in the youngest generations among us. So I really worry about that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that having some degree of mindfulness around technology is really important. And I think a place where I would maybe want to wrap things up just to kind of bring everything home is I, I think if there's any wish that I have for the people that are watching this right now, is that they'll just be a little bit more mindful about the media that they consume. You know, so much of what we're talking about today has to do with people being way, way too saturated in media in general and in the news in particular. And I think if everyone were to spend a little bit more time logging off of their phones and logging off of their media and spending real quality time with the people in their lives, you know, breaking bread, yep. getting together and cooking a meal yep. or something like, are we live in a country that is desperate for interventions that are that simple? So that would be my maybe parting message. Yeah. All right. I, I, I'm aligned with you completely. Uh, service, meaning, relating, and that's what we've not been able to do for two years. And it's been horrible, really terrible. Absolutely and it's awful. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, we, none of us should be okay after that. And so it's okay that we're not okay. But, you know, I, we, I, I started, you know, asking you how long, how to find out you, you've given me a, how do you, how do we get out? Which is, you know, it's Voltaire. It, it'll, he says, il faut cultiver nos jardins. We must cultivate our gardens. That was his last like line it. in in Candide, which is which is a, a giant metaphor for our relationships and, and our communities and, and our homes. Um, and so let's let's leave it there after this uh, romp we've had through all kinds of topics. I really appreciate I you being here with me. You've been very generous with your time. I've kept you well beyond what I said I would, and, and I appreciate you. And I hope we'll stay in touch. I hope so too. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Leslie Carr, uh, drlesliecarr.com. Uh, and you can, uh, Caleb, put up all her stuff too, you know, the book and the podcast and everything. Uh, the Nature of Nurture, I think was the other, the podcast. And look for these things. Obviously, she, I, I must have seen, I, I don't remember where I encountered Dr. Carr, but I remember thinking, I must speak to her. I must speak to her. And, and she did not disappoint. Um, Margaret, uh, you tell me if you want me to talk about those things you sent me from locals. I didn't see your response to that. And unfortunately the scroll has moved by. So I don't know if you want me to answer those questions. I can actually even read the question if you want. Um, it's hard for me to answer those things, uh, in email forms. Uh, so you're gonna have to tell me here on the restream what, what you would like. Uh, Susan is in there also. She's on Twitch. I see her messing around there. And, um, Oops, Clubhouse is doing weird things on me. I think I better, oh, the room closed for some reason. That was weird. I, I didn't intend to close the room. It just closed on me. Oh, no, here it is. Here it is. It's back. It's back. Sorry about that. I thought I closed the room. Um, so I'll tell you what. Uh, I've got to kind of wrap things up here. So uh, I'm going to say thank you to Caleb and thank you to Susan for producing these things as always. Thank you to Michelle Poe for setting up um setting up Dr. Carr. And I don't know that we have guests set up for when we're in New York, 
but uh, it's like the uh, Wheel of Fortune is going on going on tour. And we're going to be from New York. Oh, Clubhouse muted? Yes, it did mute. How about that? Thank you. There you are. I'm seeing you back on Clubhouse. Sorry about that. It did that by itself. That was not me for a change. Uh, the Clubhouse just spontaneously muted. And, and it really, it blinked at me, and then everyone kind of dropped off the, the hand-raising thing. It was very weird. Uh, all right, Caleb, uh, you've got travel coming up too, but you're going after we go to New York. Is that correct? Yeah. So we have two shows. We'll have a show on, uh, Tuesday, the 19th and a show on Wednesday, the 20th. And then we're taking off all right, fair. for like a bit of time, about a week. About a week back for the following Friday. So yeah. it's the end, it's the end of this week for us here. And, uh, we will see you next week. Margaret, you're going to have to Send me an email again through locals to tell me what you want to do with those questions you're asking. They're easy questions to answer, and you're on the right track. I will just tell you that that much. All right, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Dr. Carr, and we will uh, see you next week. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my